My dear and honourable brothers and elders and my honourable mothers and sisters, you know, each and every second that passes by in this human's life, in San's life, wallahi, is extremely, extremely valuable. And we are constantly at a battle. We're constantly in a tug of war with the time which loses from our life. You know, alhamdulillah, you can go to a local bank, a vault, uh, a security deposit box, and you can put your belongings somewhere to be held, somewhere to be put in reserve, somewhere that you can put on ice. Nowhere in the world can, is there any mechanism, any tool for you to stop life leaving your life. By someone there's nowhere in the world that you can store your time. There's no vault in the world. There's no storage place in the world. There's nothing at all. The only thing we have that is irreversible, that is something that you can never get again, is the seconds, the minutes, the hours, the days, the months, and the years in your life. And every human being has been allotted a different amount. Some people a few hours, some people a few days, some people a few months, some people a few years. I just received a, me a message recently about a particular sheikh who's abroad. And subhanAllah, he's of the age of 100. He's probably one of the most oldest surviving people on the face of the earth. I mean, I know obviously, we don't, they don't know his date of birth because if you generally ask our elders, where were you born? If they're past the age of 70 and they're from abroad, they say, you know, I was born in the summer some I was born in the winter, <laughs> they don't even know themselves, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But obviously I'm just saying that the age specifically wasn't mentioned, but in terms of how many years he had passed, that was in mention. But what I'm trying to point out, dear brothers, is that each and every one of you, see the thing what shaitan makes us think is that, oh, I'm young, I've got plenty of time left. So I've got plenty of time, I've got plenty of years, and I can always change in the future, and I can always do something better for myself in five years' time. I'm still young. And this is generally a false thinking from the parents as well. Why? Because whenever the call for deen comes, whenever there's any discourse of deen, we somehow think that we're kind of, it's more for elders and youngsters are just not, it's not for them. Young discourse is not for young children. Discourse, Islamic discourse is not for the youth. Discourse is not for those children who go to school. It's a misconception. Anyone, anyone who is a reciter of la ilaha illallah, the deen is practical for him and her irrespective of the age. Deen is very, very applicable to every marhala and stage of your life. Huh? No doubt about it, but when you're not going to be baligh, then naturally there are things that are not going to be. When you're not physically mature, the rulings of Islam, the sharia, the laws, the Quran, the hadith, the ahkam and so on, they're not applicable to you because you are below a certain age, but they're still relevant. So first and foremost, one thing which is really important is understand one thing. Time we have is a big, big, what is it? A blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no person on the face of this earth can predict and say, oh, I will die at this particular time or I will die in these moments. There's no one, no one, no one knows their date of death. Many of people know their date of birth. No one, no one can predict the day they're going to die. When you generally have doctors, medical professionals that will say, look, based on the signs, we predict that you have this much amount of time. But by Allah, no one knows the exact moment this individual is going to leave from this worldly life. Now, as I said, some people have more, some people have less. Some people live until ripe old ages. Some people live when they're very, very young. This is all the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some get more, some get less. Some are fortunate to have a very easy life. Some unfortunately don't have such an easy life. This is all the decree, the irada and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, how much you live in this life, that won't be of concern to you on the day of Qiyamah. It won't be that I lived, that I had five years more than this individual or two years less than that individual. This won't even be of concern. What will be of concern is which condition you present with on the day of Qiyamah. That's going to be of major concern. And in addition to that, once you move beyond this worldly life and you pass, inshallah, through ease in the akhirah, by sab amin to go, inshallah, let Allah make it easy, Allah make it such that everyone passes with ease. And in addition to that, if Allah gives us entry into Jannah, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, لَيْسَ يَتَحَسَّرُ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا عَلَى سَاعَةً مَرَّتْ بِهِمْ لَمْ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فِيهَا You want to know if, what, if there's a regret? There is a regret for the inhabitants of Jannah. Listen carefully. There's a regret for who? The inhabitants of 
Jannah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't, you won't feel uncomfortable, you won't feel dissatisfied, you won't feel pain, anger, sorrow, nothing like that. It would be this thinking, if I could have done more, I could have done this, I could have perhaps, and you know, a, a certain desire, an inclination. What is that inclination? What is that thing? What is that sort of thing that you, you if you would change, you would change one thing about the worldly life? What, what is it? And the hadith points out, لَيْسَ يَتَحَسَّرُ أَهْلُ jannah illa. There's nothing, nothing, nothing you'll regret. You won't regret that well, I lived in a four-bedroom house in this area. I wish I had a five-bedroom. Oh, I wish I had a two-bedroom in this particular city. I wish I had a flat in this area. Oh, I wish I had this car. I wish I had that car. This will be absolutely no importance. What will affect you mostly will be that time, that time you passed in your worldly life and you had not remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will be a source of upset. Now without any issue, we pass hours and hours and hours on fruitless, absolutely frivolous activities, more so the youth than our elders, more so. It's easy for a youngster to come in from school, put down his bag, jump on Fortnite for five hours. It's easy for a youngster to go home from school, go inside and put his long list of to watch films on his recommended watch list. It's easy for that youngster. And by sim our elders aren't free from this. And the women, oh, toba toba. Every day, Star Plus, ARY, and all the other things. By there's one after the other, one after the other. One finishes, another one starts, another one starts. By market me thore, there's so much going on. However, what I'm trying to say is that the youngsters are more victim to this because now we're in a global platform. And what happens is, is that before there, at least there was something, Yaar Kecholo, we're wasting time. Do something with your life, do something with the hours, do something with your day. Make something of yourself. But now because everything is about impressing the other person, hours upon hours, getting the best score, getting the best getting the, on the highest scoreboard, impressing people so when you can go back you can say, yeah, that battle royale, I came first. I came first on this. I did better than this person. I am the talk of the class. By Allah, Ajib, it means that it really it boils down to this. You don't like yourself. You don't have that self-respect and self-esteem for yourself. That you need validating from other people. You need someone to talk to you. You need someone to big you up. Only then you feel comfortable. That's what it boils down to, right? Why does someone disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing it's wrong? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm going into another thing now. Fortnite is a waste of time, but I'm saying certain things where we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, let's, let's, let's just hit the nail on the head. Why are we beating him around the bush? How many Muslim youths there are now that are having New Year's Eve parties? How many Muslim youths there are that are going out on a, on, on a mad rampage, on a, on, a, on a mad bender? How many people do we have, Muslim girls and Muslim boys, are even attending the London fireworks? Now we can sit here and pretend this is not happening in our communities. And we can say, Nini, oh, Mursab, what are you talking about? Let me tell you, we know because people contact our phones. People call us. People shed tears to us. That this is the condition of my youngsters. This is the condition of my daughter. This is the condition of my son. When we say anything deen, they, turn, they, they frown. What on earth are you talking about? Now, I know obviously I'm going off on a thing, but... If we were to instill in those youngsters' time things related to deen from a young age, as opposed to just iPads, as opposed to just Fortnite, as opposed to just games, as opposed to just Grand Theft Auto and all these mashup games, then at least come si come they would have some ta look with deen. But you have to take the time out to make that happen in your houses. It's all in good saying the children should do it. What did you do to implement that? By me, I say, but then maybe I'm, wallahu alam, maybe you man have probably got a proper lock off. Well, we can see from the gathering, we've got 10,000 Muslims in Cruelly, and you can do the maths yourself of how many people attend. So, my point in mentioning is this this time which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is a big ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a big blessing. Muslims vying with one another who can hold the better party? Who can hold the most better fireworks? The, the leading record at this moment is held by a Muslim country of letting off the most fireworks on New Year's Eve. Six million dollars spent recently, one Muslim country. Australia toppled it with nine, seven million. Our own country here, 
When we have homeless people on the streets, the Met is cutting the costs to what they're giving towards the police officers. The NHS is getting squeezed and we're spending 2.3 million on a fireworks display that's going to last not even 10 to 12 minutes. I'm not against people having fun. If you think about a khush molvi yar. I'm not against people having fun. Fun is separate. We're not talk- it doesn't mean you have to do something to disobey Allah for it to be fun. Remember that very clearly. There are a number of things Islam promotes that is allowed, are allowed, recommended and encouraged to do. But where there is absolutely zero benefit, zero fayda, no, what do you get out of that? And with, that's just the fireworks. And then calculate the alcohol nausebillah that gets drunk. And all the drugs that get taken. All this, it topples within the millions. UN released a report. The UN released the report that if only 30 billion, listen carefully, 30 billion, it is not a lot of money. If you look in how much the people were the top richest people in the world, each one of them in the top 10 can alleviate poverty from the, from the world for a year each, each, each of them. I mean, the richest person in the world, Bezos, he can do it for four years. My point of mentioning is this, 30 billion, how much worldwide, globally, on this night is mankind and humankind spending? Let's put Muslim out of the equation for a second. We have a hak to say this. Why? Because the Institute of Zakat was there to alleviate these ahwal from mankind. Whereas if we just took the money we spent on this night, with all the fuzuliyat, and by Allah, you go and hear the statistics, you'd be shocked. Millions and millions just in our local areas, globally, Billions upon billions are being spent. But there is not a global fikr to alleviate poverty. Rather, selfishness. I want to enjoy myself for a few minutes. That selflessness needs to change into selflessness. What are we actually celebrating? What? If someone came to me, I know this is a big thing in our communities. You know this whole thing about birthdays? Even birthdays. Right? I'll touch upon this because it's relevant to what I'm about to say next. Now, this is the thing in our community, right? When it comes to occasions like this, they will vie with one another. And I was, subhanAllah, I was coming up my house, literally, wallah. My son will tell you if you don't believe, ask him afterwards. We're just coming out, and opposite the road, someone's popping off some fireworks. So the lady stops, she goes, She takes out her phone and takes a quick couple of snapshots. Now, the kid's only five years old, six years old. Now, listen carefully. We're not here to judge anybody. We're not here to make people feel like they're worthless. But what impression are we putting on that child's mind? I mean, so, it's okay to waste money, it's okay just to disregard everybody else. I know this is a bit philosophical, but okay, people are doing it, let them do it, that's their business, fair enough. But when a Muslim pays attention to those things which are questionable, borderline impermissible, and at times very impermissible, then what happens is that in the psychology of that child, it's accepted because mum and dad said it was okay. Mum and dad used to celebrate it, mum and dad thought it was good, they would take us to go and see the displays. And then we complain 15 years later that the children are off their deen. It's not one issue that occurs. It's a number of different things. The biggest issue we have in our youth, in this country, in our country, is identity crisis. People don't know whether they're Asian, they're African, they're Muslim, they're what? They don't know. Our thing, forget culture to the side. I say this with a passion and a vengeance. I say kick culture to the side. Culture caused the problem, Islam will be the solution. Let me say that again. Culture is the what? The problem. Islam is the solution to the problem. All these marriage breakups we have, 99% are because of culture, not because of the deen. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, خيركم 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 The best of you is best of you who is to his wives. What dunya did he give his family? Tell me. When the wives, they got together and made this plan that we're going to ask him for more. He was so upset, he separated himself for 29 days, he even completely naraz. So he, was he furnishing their homes with Italian this and ensuite bathrooms and every year new car and international holidays? This wasn't even in existence. But what made him a good husband? It was the akhlaq. Islam showed akhlaq. We're providing for our families to an extent. When I say to an extent, because a lot of the times it's our own selfish needs. I'm working 14 hours a day, Monasab, because I'm buying properties in Pakistan. Brother, your kids are from here. They're growing up here. Let them go back one or two machar cut bite them. They're coming back. Lord shedding, they're not gonna sit in four hours in the heat. You've got to think forward for here. You know, those of you who have children, you take your youths. They come back, we ask them, how did you like your holiday? I hated it. We asked the children, how did you find your holiday? I hated it. I wanted to come back. 
So we have to think out of the box. Now I'm sorry if this comes across as crude. That I'm accepting the status quo. Well, the reality is this: that when you instit- if you bring Deen into your families, Deen, Islam, they will love Islam. But when we're bringing culture into our thing, some things are okay. Some things are within the boundary of Deen, and for that we accept. But those things which are blatantly, flamboyantly, openly, disgracefully against the Deen. Our marriages, let me not even open up another subject. Our marriages are breaking, as I said, what? And generally a lot of the time because of cultural issues. Cultural issues. But coming back, like I said, this open up, I said, a can of worms. Why I said what I said was because when we embrace those things which are un-Islamic, these are seeds which are being planted in that child's mind. All of this goes to contribute to that child's moving far and far away from the deen of Allah. Subhanallah, Harun Rashid Rahmatullahi Ali, one of the great Abbasid Khalifs. If you don't know who he is, but just understand he was a great leader of the Muslim Ummah in the Banu Abbas. And he's noted for establishing Darul Hikmah and great Islamic seminaries, institutes, and the likes. Anyways, what happened was is that he built this big yard, massive yard, and he embellished it with everything he could get his hands on, made a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece of his time. So he gave everybody Dawud, like we do, isn't it? you build a house or and then you call everyone for da'wat and you say by look at mashallah look at the wall look at the marble and then the Andalus people are saying mashallah like in Andalus are never on and but you look what he's got and then we go home and this is the problem I'll say this right you know when you have brothers that go to holidays abroad when they come back they're ghab you don't see them I thought he'd come back a month ago yeah but he's been working 16 hours a day since he returned <laughs> why because what have you done you've been sitting in England for 15 years where you've been sitting 15 years, what have you got? Tere ko leke, what have you got? Tu nakam insan yaar, tu flanaya dingeya. That's what happens. So him, the same mindset 1400 years ago, 3000 years ago, has always been the same. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فِتْنَةٍ وَفِتْنَ أُمَّةِ الْمَالِ Mal, the wealth will be a distraction. And it will be a fitna for my ummah. So what happened was, Harun Rashid called all these notable individuals. He wants to show them this masterpiece of a house which he's made. He's asking people, okay, what do you think of it? Next person, what do you think of it? What do you think of it? And it gets to Abu al-Ata'iyah rahmatullahi who is a poet of his time, a great, great alim of deen as well. So he said to him, you're staying quiet. Siflana ma nahnu min fi dunya. Bay tell us. Bay tell us something. What's happening? What have we got? So he looks at it and he says, he mentions these following these words, right? And before I say this very, very quickly, there is, Islam does not discourage you having things of this world so long as they not distract you from the deen of Allah. Does everyone understand that? Islam, by listen carefully to this. Islam, Islam never ever said that we have to make ourselves live on bread and butter and live on nothing else. There is this general perception amongst our people in this community that if my child goes into the lines of deen, we've heard this, so I'm saying the same words. Where's he going to eat from tomorrow? Where's he going to get his sustenance from? How, 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 it, tell me something practical. So our general fear is that if the child goes into the lines of deen, then what's going to happen is, is that all, God forbid, but all hell will break loose and he'll die on poverty. But anyway, what happened was, is that sticking on the subject, I wanted to make this very, very clear. Because there's nothing wrong with you building a house or having certain things of this worldly life. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'll give you a simple thing. Most people understand, but I'll translate as well. They say, Maldar banneme. Haraj nahi hai. Maldar banne mein haraj nahi hai. Duniyadar banne mein haraj hai. But there's nothing wrong with having wealth. Brother, if you earn 100k a year, alhamdulillah, earn 200k. Mashallah, good. Because you give more zakat, you'll help the ummah. Alhamdulillah. You help your poor relatives. Help alleviate, you know, in our communities. I had one brother, subhanallah, who I met. Anyway, he, he mashallah, Allah gave him lots of wealth. Allahu Akbar. He's from Pakistan. And he was going back and he said, I want you to tell me what, give me some nasiha. And he thought I'd probably say to him, yeah, get your bister, go four months jamaat, go to khanka, go this. And I just said to him, bye, mashallah, hold on to your deen. That's first, of course. But this money Allah gave you, how do you plan to use this money Allah gave you? And I said, do you want my advice? He told me he's from this village, right, in some proper gra somewhere. So I said, set up a free educational establishment, educate the children in deen and dunya both. 
Teach 100 children, minimum. But Allah's given you so much, teach 100. Don't take nothing from them, make this shart on them. Okay, I'm gonna educate you, I don't want nothing in return, this what I want, I want you to educate 10 more people in your life at one time. This is the qarza, if you can do it. Then because of your efforts, inshallah, 100 will be educated. And mashallah, he could afford to do 5,000 if he wanted to. Allah gave that much. But he goes, okay, that's a fair number. So he wanted to start on that. Then think, those 100 become 1,000. Those 1,000 with the same usul can become even more. Do you get where, I'm, where this is going? If everybody had this same fikr, poverty, hunger, and you know, illiteracy would eradicate across the globe. But we've become selfish. We need to become more selfless. Anyway, Abu Lata'iya rahmatullah alayhi, what's he saying? He got called to this banquet. And look at the look at the Thailand, the look at the pump and Patani. So he, they're looking at it and everyone's giving their ta'arif. But then what did he say? He said, Ishma bada laka salima fi dhilli shahika dil qusuri. But he said it in Arabic poetry because he is a poet. Spit bars, right? You know what spitting bars is, right? So he spat bars in Arabic. He goes, Ish ma bada laka salima fi dhulli shahika dil qusuri. Yus'a ilayka mashtahayta ladar rawahiya wil bakuri. So he said these first two jumlas, which translated means, by living these big, tall, lofty buildings, providing this great, great saya and this great shadow for you. Live in comfortable, live in, live in, live in peace, you will live in peace. Anytime you need something, everything, yus'a ilayka mashtahayta, anything you desire, anything you want, at your beck and call will be bought for you. When you come, when you go, morning, noon, and night, anything that you need will be met. And now he's, as they say, gassed. You know, gassed, right? He was gassed. So then what happened was he turned around and goes, فَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ تَقَعْقَعَتْ فِي ذِيقِ حَشْرَجَةِ الصُّدُورِ فَهُنَاكَ تَعْلَمُ مُوْقِنَا مَا كُنْتَ إِلَّا فِي غُرُورِ Oi, oi, oi. When he said this, when he, he was so gassed and he was happy, he goes, and then, and then, now he wants to hear more. He said, but then a time will have to come and pass. A time will happen. It will come to you. You can live in a 1500 canal place. You can live in a 1200 marala place. You can live in a 10 acre plot, a ranch, a palace, a kingdom. You can live in the skies on the ground in, on, on another planet. Wallahi, death will come to you exactly the same way as it came from the first person to the last. You can't escape it, my brother. You can't escape it, my sister. He said, a time will come, فَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ تَقَعْقَعَتْ What will happen is, is that your soul will start making this knocking sound in the chest of your body. And it will come in the tightness of your chest, you will feel your soul being taken out. فَهُنَاكَ تَعْلَمُ مُوْقِنَا Put your makan to the side, put your wealth to the side, put your business to the side, put your children's degrees to the side. Now you will know when your soul is being taken. Okay. Oh, I was in a loss. I should have done more for my akhirah. At that time, he started crying. And you know, they say, Because if you call a few, because they'll, they'll say, no, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Rather, don't do that. Rather, but it's all hikmah. Baby. What does Maulana get out of telling you to become good in the akhirah? Maulana ko commission milte bhai? Does he get any money from you? Do I get, let's just say, hypothetically, out of this gathering, a hundred of you were to become the wallies of your time. Does that help me? Bhai, does that help me? No, it doesn't. For akhirah, that's another story. In this world, nothing's happening. Or now we want it either. Your benefit, my brother. And this is the thing ulama have always wanted. They tell you this. Not because they're telling you off or they dislike you. They have a dard, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, I can see that if they just practiced upon deen, their lives could be potentially so much more better. There's that pain that keeps the ulama constantly advising our communities. Oh my days. We said that we get so happy with the passing of time. We're just killing time. What are you doing, bro? I'm just killing time. Time is not something to be killed. You're supposed to spend time. You're supposed to spend time properly. Every day that passes in your life, irrespective if you're 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100, you are getting moved closer and closer to the qabr and the grave. 
And for that reason, you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to pass from this worldly life. Allahu Akbar, recently, keep this in mind, time out and think of this for a sec. One Molana, young, in his 40s, very, very, mashallah, healthy otherwise, he took a trip abroad, came back, had a bit of pain in his kidney, he was like, I don't feel right. So they said, go to the hospital. He went, and within four hours, he died, Allahu Akbar. Baisab, he died. I was, at, I was up north recently, just recently. There was one young lad, Allahu Akbar, Half his Quran, 19 years old, and mashallah, his ustad was the Imam Sahib of the masjid, right? So, Imam Sahib in Sana, he had to go somewhere the next day. So, he said to him, Do me a favor, can you lead Fajr for me, please? I'll be back by Zohar, but can you just do Fajr for me? So, the student said, Ustadji, of course, I'll, I'll love to, it's an honor, so I'll, I'll come in the morning, inshallah. He goes home and he says to his pops, who's also a Hafiz of Quran, he goes, Abba, I'm going to go sleep early because I've got to wake up for Fajr namaz. Molly Sahib asked me, so may, you know, I'm going to make sure I do. Anyway, what happened is, is that the youngster's ma'mool and his general habit, he'd be up by about 6 o'clock, get to the masjid and so on. Time is part, and I'm saying 6 just so you get an understanding of time now, otherwise it happened a few months, like more in the summertime. Time comes, he's looking at the clock, Kibay wears, the sun hasn't woken up, he goes and knocks on the door. He goes and knocks on the door, no reply. He goes into the room, and to his utter shock, the 19-year-old young Hafiz of Quran breathed his last in his sleep. This is just, you know, I'm, I'm, we, hundreds of examples of this. Didn't we have a janazah, a little while back, a girl, she was just young, had a slip, just banged her head a little bit and she died within a few hours. But there's no guarantee that you're going to live. You know, I'm going to, we have these plans that I'm going to be 60, everyone's going to be around me. It's as if it's going to be like harps are playing, and there's going to be Sakina descending from the skies and there's going to be cherubs everywhere and I'm going to say my shahada and pass from this worldly life. Brother, you're living in cuckoo land, mate. You're living in the head with your grand, the ground like an ostrich. If you can't even fix up and come to the, and to pray, and even to pray salah and we can't even make decisions for bettering of our deen and you think we're going to just have this perfect moth, this ain't Cinderella, it doesn't end up with a, with a big bang. Our life, my dear brothers, may Allah forgive me. We have to give. These are the missile our youngsters understand. This is the problem. Anyway, like I said, every day that passes in your world like, is pushing you more closer to your, your, your mold. I said, time out, now come back. Now I say, for that reason, increase your a'mal on a daily basis because when that soul goes, you never have a chance to even say istighfar, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, not even once. So why not do it now? And you won't regret. Look, what did the hadith say? You won't regret over what you didn't do in the dunya. Oh ho, I didn't go this place. Oh ho, I didn't go Ibifa. Oh ho, I didn't go Magaluf. Oh ho, I didn't go here. Na'uzubillah, leave this gun. Leave this filth. Leave all these Najai's aspirations. This won't affect you. And these youngsters now, it's like funny, I think I'm going to come to an end just now. Allah forbid, even the youngish sort of parents in the culture of things, when there's sort of gatherings, they get happy. Nausabilla, they get happy. They see the children dancing and they take the pictures, upload it on their status, and everyone gets happy as if it's something good to do. As time starts passing and that elder gets older, his hair starts getting white, he starts feeling weaker, aspirations are getting slower and slower, getting dim. Then what happens is when he sees his children doing wrong things, it hits him and hurts him and he wishes that his children didn't do this. But it's a vicious cycle because then they get their youngsters to do it. And then they get their youngsters to do it. And then they get, and it constantly happens, Nauzubillah. Until we make a U-turn, everyone just follows suit. So why am I even saying this? Why even say such things from the house of Allah? Why even say such things from the member? Why, my dear brothers, is because the effort of change has to start from you. You have to make the change. You're going to be the one that has to have to make that U-turn. No one can force you. No one can pu push you in that direction. You have to push yourself. This is why we strongly advise all people, subhanAllah, all brothers, all sisters. In Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he mentioned, I haven't got no, I've got zero regrets. I have zero regrets about my life. You know what I'm really upset about? Who said this? Who? Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Who is Abdullah bin Mas'ud? He's a who? Sahabi of the Prophet So he said, I haven't got any regrets. I've got zero regrets. No, I wouldn't say, I wish I'd done this, I had done that, or oh, Yarkashka this. 
Zero regrets. The only regret I've got, and this is a Sahabi saying this, Allahu Akbar. Think of the a'mal he would do in the presence of the Prophet, in the, in the company of his home, he's in seclusion. Imagine for a second, he's saying this, I haven't got no regrets. I've only got a regret over that day that passes from my life. And when I think about it, it, it has decreased from my life when my actions haven't increased. My dear brothers, wallahi, you know, these, why do we always give examples of Sahaba, Tabi'een, and so on? It's because these are the examples within, our, in, within the Ummah we can take massive guidance from. But I just want to finish off and give you a couple of examples locally. And inshallah, maaf karna, bai thoda bohat to chalta rata na, bas ek do minute inshallah, then we'll finish off. Okay, bai khana aagya? Chalo, thiki phir, we've is here as well, so I'll just take two minutes. Right? And then basically it's like this. People may say, Yad, you give an example of Sahabi, you give an example of Harun Rashid and this person, Flana Dinga and so on. Listen, we came from up north, right, recently again. And subhanallah, you know, we, Ajib, I was this one Molana, we were just having a chat. I'll cut the chase. Young boy, subhanallah, young boy, seven year old became Hafiz of Quran. Do you understand? And I've got loads of examples like this. Do you? Anyways, I was saying that now literally we have so many examples within our community of young young children becoming Hafiz of Quran studying the deen of Allah that, that you can achieve it the only problem is my dear brothers you as family we need to put something in place don't deprive them completely I say regulate what they do. I mean, subhanAllah, some of this stuff is shocking, man. The games you're going around. You, you get more points for shooting someone in the face. What sort of game? What is going to happen to the mentality of that child? But indeed, everyone's playing it. Everyone's playing it. Well, everyone's also taking drugs and also doing it. What are we do here? Why stop? Do everything. Why hold back? So you can't say what everyone's doing it. No, we're not sheep, my dear brothers. We're not sheep because we have the life of Sahaba and Rasulullah, we have the best example. We're not knocking anyone else. That's their life. Do it. Fine. Your business. But me as a Muslim, subhanAllah, me as a Muslim, I can choose, can I? Have you ever seen anyone that is a non-Muslim celebrating Muslim holidays? Have you ever heard in the history of your life, a person buys a ram, rears the ram, looks after the ram, slaughters it on Eid al-Adha and distributes the meat? Guni, it's, uh, it's an occasion of, of happiness. Have you ever heard that? Forget to see it, have you ever even heard of it? But yet, look what happens in our homes. How, how many Muslims, Christmas trees in their homes, Christmas gifts in their homes. What's happening with our communities? This is why we say, my dear brothers, don't fall from what we see on the outside. Look on the inside, Allahu Akbar. We have a lot of people in our communities, but Vahir, it seems everything is hunky-dory, but it ain't, I'm telling you it's not. And I'm not here to make everyone feel it's doom and gloom, there's a lot of hope left. The solution to our halat and conditions, and the remedy for our difficult situation and predicaments we are in, and the only solution to get out of this darkness, whether it's camel age, rocket age, ice age, but then space age, matrix age, whatever age you want to call it. The solution to our halat and conditions and the solution to our problems. Allah already told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 1400 years ago. He said, I've completed this deen. I perfected this deen. Any halat and the condition that comes will be found in that same deen which you and I are running away from. This is why we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He makes this gathering a means of hidayat and islah. Say ameen bhai. Maqsad is not just to gather people. And you body soni ga lo. Isi ji masha. Tayyuh ho bandhe san. Dert so bandhe san. It doesn't matter if two people are sitting. If people say in that, do you know what? He's got a point. The other ulama have a point. Look at the direction of my life. I need to fix up. I need to come back to the deen. No one said it's going to be easy. It's going to be tough. But on that you will get your ajr my brother. On that you will get your reward. So let's go from this intention, go from this gathering with this intention. Okay, inshallah, I will, myself personally, and judge yourself to yourself, I will try to improve my life the best way I possibly can, inshallah. May Allah give us all the tawfiq and the ability to make amal and practice. And may Allah inspire us to be able to bring change and khayr in our hearts. And give us the ability to take these words to everybody at home. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen.